Good afternoon and welcome to the fifth of our Down to Earth seminars. Today we're joined by um, our director, Tim Grossi, who's responsible for our geophysics operations within Ask KG Sciences. Tim is a chartered geologist who specialised in near-surface geophysical surveys for the duration of his career. After studying geophysics at the University of Leicester, he's gained over 20 years combined post-grad and commercial experience in ground investigation it grand investigation industry working in the UK and abroad. We'll just quickly go over a few um, housekeeping issues. So uh, just to remind us everybody, your microphones are off so we can't hear you. Um, if anybody has any questions to ask, then please feel free to type them into the questions box um, and we'll get around to them at the end of the presentation. If we have any questions that we can't answer um, today, then we'll be sure to get back to you all individually afterwards. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Tim. Thank you, Mark. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I'll turn my webcam off um, for the duration of the presentation and I'll, I'll turn it back on again at the end. So during this RSK Down to Earth webinar, I'll be providing a broad overview of geophysical surveys that can be used as part of the ground investigation. The application of geophysics is varied and far reaching. And unfortunately, I won't have time to go into detail of all techniques and scenarios within the short time of this webinar. But I will begin by looking at when geophysics should be used and factors that may affect the success of a survey. In the second part of the webinar, I'll provide a quick overview of some of the common techniques and some considerations for their particular use. So when is geophysics used within a ground investigation? Generally, there are two distinct types of inquiry that we receive. The first is reactionary, in response to something that has been found or happened on the site, and something was unexpected or at least unplanned for. Some examples might include encountering buried former foundations, causing the obstruction on the ongoing site works, uncovering an unrecorded buried utility crossing a site, or discovering shallow voids or loose material. These types of inquiry usually need a quick response as there are other works now being held up until these problems can be dealt with. And more often than not, the site environment is now more challenging for us to deal with because there are other site operations and constraints to work around. The second type of inquiry generally relates to proactive and pre-planned works, either because it has already been identified that the geophysical survey will deliver specific information or because the initial phases of the planning have identified uncertainties within the ground model that the geophysical surveys can help to inform on. For example, if an initial desk-based review highlighted a high risk of dissolution features beneath the site, a geophysical survey can be proactively instructed in order to potentially highlight areas to target with intrusive techniques. And this, of course, is in contrast to undertaking the geophysics survey purely because one of the intrusive locations encountered a void. So for most unexpected situations where geophysics is required at the last minute, there was probably an opportunity for early engagement with the geophysicist earlier in the planning pro project planning. Surveys might have been undertaken to avoid this later situation. However, it's often a risk versus cost situation and different clients will perceive or manage their risks in different ways. So very broadly, the typical stages of a ground investigation may look something like this graphic. The works would commence with a desk study, which would hopefully be used to aid some part of the site walkover or reconnaissance. Of course, this may be part of the same preliminary phase, but at some point there'll be some actual works on site. And depending on the nature and size of the investigation, this may be split into preliminary or detailed or follow-up phases. So at what point should geophysics be best utilized? The simple answer is as early as possible. But the reality is that the full objective and requirement from the geophysics data should be fully understood before dictating where the survey should sit in the program. Although very often geophysical surveys will inform on future location of intrusive works, sometimes the reverse is also true. And certain aims of the geophysical survey cannot be realized until some other aspect of the investigation has been completed. In an ideal world, the majority of the geophysics would be scheduled as part of the preliminary stage investigation or between the preliminary and main stage investigation. This provides the opportunity for the geophysics results to be investigated, 
the design of the main works to be planned or modified in accordance with the results, and if required, for revision of the geophysical interpretations and ground model as additional information becomes available. The main purpose and advantage of engaging with and utilising geophysical surveys early in the project is that they can usually help to reduce uncertainty in the ground model, thereby reducing risk in the long term. So there are three broad reasons geophysical surveys are used in ground investigations. We are seeking to locate a buried feature, which may be a naturally occurring or, or man-made. By far the most common man-made feature we are asked to map are buried utilities. And my colleague Gerwin Lee gave a detailed webinar on the use of geophysical techniques for mapping buried utilities with reference to PAS 128 earlier in the year. This can be re reviewed on the RSK website if you missed it. It should be noted that the feature may be known to exist on the site, or it may not be there at all, but we're trying to confirm its presence or otherwise. This is essentially the case in archeological investigations. Other features such as former mine shafts and adits, storage tanks, buried foundations, the extent to fill, and in certain areas within the country, potential buried UXO are also common features. Geophysical surveys, are also regularly used to inform on the subsurface geological conditions, which might include determining the depth of rockhead, depth of the water table, or providing information on layering or other contacts within the subsurface. And also geophysical surveys can be used to derive engineering properties in certain situations, which might include surveys within and between boreholes. Broadly speaking, these three types of survey also have their primary geophysical techniques that will be most useful for delivering the right information to meet the desired objective. Surface geophysical techniques, including magnetics, electromagnetics, GPR and gravity. In addition to targeting specific features of a site, many of these techniques can be used in a reconnaissance manner. They may be used to cover relatively large areas of ground cost effectively to provide some level of information on the whole site. If undertaken at the preliminary investigation stage, then this may provide information on otherwise unknown features within the site too. Surveys may confirm or rule out areas for further follow-up geophysical or targeted intrusive investigation. Cross-section geophysical techniques, including seismic and electrical resistivity. These techniques are generally are always, not always deployed along linear profiles and can be used to provide targeted information that varies with depth along the profile. Generally, the data take longer to collect than the reconnaissance techniques, and so they're not often used without some prior knowledge or expectations of the subsurface conditions. Borehole and intrusive techniques commonly include seismic, GPR, electrical magnetic, and electromagnetic techniques to derive physical properties measurements. Depending upon how they are deployed, these can either be very quick or very time-consuming surveys. Generally, downhole and crosshole seismic surveys are lengthy operations. However, wireline logging techniques allow some geophysical data to be collected relatively quickly within boreholes. The grouping of these techniques into these types is very broad. Some techniques sit across more than one area. For example, GPR can be considered a surface and cross-sectional investigation tool as it provides excellent depth information along profile. Some other techniques, such as EM and electrical, can be deployed in different configurations that will affect how the data is acquired, processed, and displayed. So the experience and competency of the person or persons designing the survey, acquiring, reviewing, and processing data, and ultimately providing interpretations and reporting is key to the success of the geophysical survey. It can be difficult to assess the competency of such persons, especially if your own knowledge of geophysics is limited and you're relying on the expertise of others to provide the right advice and approach. Section 5 of British Standard 5930 helps here and states that the geophysical survey should be implemented and interpreted by expert personnel and should be entrusted to an organisation specialising in this work. The expert geophysical advisor, such as an engineering geophysicist with chartered status, should approve all survey designs 
and interpretive reports. The geophysical expert may be an independent consultant engaged for the act of the geotechnical advisor, or maybe a senior technical expert in the specialist geophysical consultancy or contractor. It will be no surprise to you that the senior members of the RSK geophysical team are chartered, and it's a very important professional qualification we encourage junior staff to progress towards. Whatever the objective of the geophysical survey, though, there are common approaches to be followed in planning and design. With all techniques and targets, there is a risk that the required outcome will not be met. And this, as professional geophysicists, is what we're trying to avoid. It's not really in our interest to do something that won't work, and it's far easier to discuss with the client why something will not work before we do it, rather than trying to explain this after we've invested time and money in a survey. All techniques have their limitations, and there's no one survey that will provide all the answers about a site in one go. The client should appreciate that multi-technique approach to a site is often the most appropriate. There are several factors that can affect the suitability of a technique to a particular target or objective. So the contrast in physical properties, the depth of penetration and the resolution of achievable are often the three main considerations in planning a survey. However, the site environment, which can impact on the physical space available for the survey, in addition to other activities that may impact on the signal to, to, to noise, for example, must be considered. The depth of investigation versus resolution is one of the most significant trade-offs that we must deal with, and anyone designing a survey should understand how signals are attenuated. Very generally speaking, higher frequency signals are able to resolve smaller features or layers, but will become attenuated much more quickly than lower frequency signals. However, the longer wavelengths of lower frequency signals mean that whilst they may travel further, they cannot resolve such small objects or boundaries. Resolution is not just determined by the frequency of a signal. The sample or measurement frequency is also important. If the sample frequency is too low, then the feature may not be identified. Oversampling is often preferred with a sensible degree of data redundancy. Data can be discarded if not required but so usually it is not so simple to go and collect more data at a later date. The contrasts of a subsurface physical properties are also crucial to the success of the survey. Most techniques rely on the variation of physical property within the subsurface, which will result in some detectable and measurable response that can be interpreted to relate to the physical subsurface conditions. Generally, the greater the contrast, the more defined and identifiable the response. So in summary, the factors to be considered relating to the target should include the physical properties contrasts, the depth, size and geometry and orientation of targets, which will influence the profile orientations, profile spacing, sample intervals and profile lengths in the design. The environmental effects of the site are also key to determining whether the technique is likely to be effective to the desired objective. If the site conditions present some influence on the data that override the other considerations, this can quite quickly inform on what is appropriate. Most common examples of this might be the use of magnetic techniques in the built-up environment. Most often the signal from above, from above ground or shallow buried ferrous material masks any signal of interest. But in contrast, within the greenfield environment, with no other sources of magnetic noise, the technique can be used to detect very subtle variations associated with anthropogenic activity. The physical space available for survey can also limit or preclude some techniques in certain circumstances, especially the cross-section techniques, which may need a larger area or line length to image to the desired depths. As an example, the ERT technique generally returns a trapezium cross-section of data beneath the profile, with the deepest data being from the center of the line. As a broad rule of thumb, the total length of the line needs to be approximately six times the depth of investigation. Therefore, despite the suitability to detect the target, if this space is not physically available within the site, it's not likely to be the correct technique to be considered. So site factors should also be considered or separate to objective and include the access restrictions, the other site users and ongoing works, the surface obstructions, including parked vehicles or plant, adjacent overhead power lines, 
boundary fences, surface topography and surface conditions. The expert responsible for designing the geophysical survey should be able to explain the reasons for the techniques chosen in relation to the objective of the survey with reference to below and above ground conditions. And they should be able to explain the limitations of the techniques generally and specifically in relation to the area of interest. All current gaps of the information should be identified and any assumptions made in designing the survey should be clearly stated. Another key common approach to best practice is for geophysical practitioner to complete on-site data review or an initial trial. Successful outcomes are more likely to become from surveys where the data has been reviewed whilst in the field. And this just isn't the checking of quality of raw data, which should be done in any case, but the on-site assessment and initial processing that can be completed to verify that the data are suitable for the desired objective. Adjustments to survey design can be made reactively if results are not as expected. And this may include adjusting acquisition parameters, adjusting the location or length of survey profiles, or even the areas covered by the survey. An experienced and competent geophysicist should complete such reviews daily or at defined points within the acquisition phase. Ultimately, if the survey is not going to work, the geophysicist should be open with the client, not wasting time and money delivering something that's not helpful. This is where clients should consider the format and request for surveys. If the client defines a rigid scope of work that is not suitable for the objective, that presents a more, presents a more difficult situation compared to if the geophysical contractor had decided on the best techniques given the information that was required and the objectives set. I've already mentioned BS5930 with regard to the geophysical expert and experience of field staff. But this standard also provides a lot of useful information for those likely to commission surveys, including a rating for usefulness of techniques to certain applications. ASTM D6429, a guide for selecting surface geophysical methods, provides similar tables and advice on suitable techniques for different targets, while the ASTM series of standards provides detailed methodologies of how techniques should be deployed, data acquired and manipulated. The standards are available for GPR, EM, soil resistivity, seismic refraction, gravity, ground stiffness, cross hole, and other surveys. So, while still subject to interpretation, the PAS 128 document that was mentioned provides good guidance on basic instruction to underground utility surveys. So, all these documents should be referenced in scoping documents to ensure that work is completed to a defined and minimum standard. So, via guide C562, provides some good general information for commissioning and undertaking geophysical surveys, whilst C681 provides more specialist guidance on UXO surveys, just as the EAC guidelines provide specialist guidance for archaeological surveys. So there is a wealth of information available for clients to find out more about the common techniques and applications, or well, they can always phone and email us and we're happy to discuss and advise on the appropriate approach. We also have our technical reference manual to download from our website, which details common techniques and applications. And I'll introduce some of those common techniques now. And however strangely for a geophysics talk, I'm not actually gonna put up lots of images of data. Instead, I would direct you back to the reference manual, which has lots of examples. So for each of the common techniques, I'll present a small graph similar to this one. It's intended to illustrate the approximate detectability and depth of investigation achievable with the technique. The size of the feature to be detected is given along the x-axis and the depth of below ground level on the y-axis. In this example, the shaded area to the right of the yellow line indicates to what depth a certain size object can be detected. And these graphics are indicative only and do not consider site specific limitations, such as the site ground conditions, access and other factors that will impact on the suitability of the technique as discussed earlier. So electromagnetic systems generally work by inducing an electromagnetic field into the ground using a transmitter coil. This sets up secondary fields or eddy currents in the ground, which can be detected by a receiver coil at the surface. Properties of the primary and secondary fields can be measured and related to the conductivity of the ground. Most common systems, similar to the one shown in, in the image here, consist of fixed soil separations within one instrument housing. 
while there are different instruments available, a, a fixed coil system of the star shown will generally image to about seven to nine meters below ground level. The instruments are generally easily portable and can be used to cover several hectares a day by foot or more if mounted on or towed behind a small ATV. Other instruments that do not have fixed coils are able to image to greater depths, but they're not as portable. And as discussed earlier, the greater depth of investigations can come as a trade-off in resolution. So these other types of instrumentation may be useful for geological investigations, but are generally not quite so suitable for shallow. Most DM systems have the same limitations in being affected by above ground or near surface metal or conductive material. So they can be limited in application within the built environment, although have proven to be extremely useful in brownfield assessment to identify former foundations and other obstructions. Ground penetrating radar is one of the most versatile techniques available to us and was one of the few techniques that can be effectively deployed within the urban environment. The technique works by directing an electromagnetic wave into the ground, which is reflected to the surface of interfaces with a change in dielectric properties. A wide range of antenna frequencies can be deployed, allowing us to better target the depth of investigation, which is why the GPR is so adaptable. GPR antenna can be mounted onto hand-perched carts or towed behind vehicles for very rapid data collection campaigns. And modern instrumentation also includes high density antenna arrays to cover much larger swathes of data in each pass. And options also include multiple frequencies to be in one antenna housing. Although the GPR technique provides many options, it also has some significant limitations in conductive and broken ground where the signal become attenuated or scattered. The magnetic technique is a passive one. The Earth's magnetic field is continuously being affected by the presence of magnetic objects and using sensitive magnetometers, it's possible to identify the localized perturbations caused by buried ferrous objects. These can include pipes, cables, and drums, which often create very distinct and detectable anomalies in the magnetic field. In addition, archeological features, such as infield ditches and fired brick earth, which are much more subtle to detect, can also be found with a magnetic technique. The technique can be used to measure naturally occurring geological features, such as dikes, mineralized zones, and other contacts. However, as mentioned earlier, the technique is not well suited to the urban environment, as the man-made material above ground and in the shallow subsurface will often seek to mask signals from targets of interest. However, the technique has shown to be useful in surveying brownfield areas, locating finer mine shafts and other such features. Like magnetics, microgravity is also a passive technique. Different subsurface materials have different bulk densities, and by collecting surface measurements of the Earth's gravitational field, we look to detect variations that may indicate changes in the subsurface. The gravity meter is a very sensitive instrument that effectively seeks to measure the acceleration due to gravity at a certain location. The technique involves a significant amount of processing, but after the data have been corrected, the measurement value is related to the subsurface density. Denser materials will present with higher gravity readings and voided or low density materials will record a relative gravity low. The technique can be time consuming and therefore expensive to deploy, but when undertaken correctly, the technique is usually the most well suited to the detection of near surface voids, both man-made and naturally occurring. Limitations are that the instrument can be very sensitive to ground vibrations. So ensuring data quality and detectability of subtle signals can be critical. Often the modeling of the target response is required to have confidence that the target will present a detectable response and determine optimum station separation. Measurements of electrical ground resistance are made by introducing current, electrical current into the subsurface through metal electrodes. The electrical potential between two different electrodes can be measured as a voltage and the, resist the resistance and therefore the apparent resistivity calculated. Utilizing wider spacing of electrodes allows the deeper measurements, whilst different geometries can result in the measurements that are more sensitive to lateral or vertical variations. By deploying a series of electrodes into the ground at one time, 
and connected with multi-core cables to an automatic switching device, many measurements can be made quickly and effectively to produce a representation of the variation of electrical properties with the depth along the profile. The technique is often successfully deployed in geological and resource investigations, landfill and contamination investigations, and for locating shallow solution features. Seismic techniques are extremely useful for geotechnical and engineering ground investigations. There are several different methods, refraction, reflection, MACW, CSW, down and cross hole techniques, that all have their particular benefits and limitations. All methods work on the principle of transmission of an acoustic wave through the ground. The type of waves and the way that they interact at interfaces or across boundaries of acoustic impedance define how the technique is best used. And seismic refraction, MSOW and CSW are most used in the shallow ground investigations. They're very versatile and useful for evaluating depth to bedrock and for determining physical properties in the shallow subsurface. Reflection surveys tend to be used for larger scale investigations and generally come at a greater cost. But reflections will be more likely used where detailed information about subsurfing la subsurface layering or internal structure is required. So that was just a quick overview of common techniques and further information can be found in our reference manual. Hopefully the key points to take away from this webinar are that the time and effort spent engaging with the geophysicist at the start of the project can often help to reduce risk and uncertainty in the ground model later on. To understand the objective of the survey and the limitations due to the techniques and the environment so that realistic expectations can be managed. A geophysical expert ideally charted, should be engaged to ensure that the appropriate techniques are being deployed and utilised effectively. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. I hope you found this webinar useful and I'd be happy to take any questions now or can field questions offline via email. Thanks Tim, that was a great presentation. I've um, got a few questions for you. Uh, we'll get into those. If anybody's got any burning questions, there's still time to get those into us. Uh, first off, uh, you said multiple techniques are sometimes needed. Doesn't this just make the cost of geophysics surveys even higher? Yeah, no, that's, that's a, a good point. I think um, there's the, the situation where we're using a particular technique to look at one type of uh, physical properties contrast, uh, but not that won't always give the, the, the whole picture of the ground. So for example, we might have a depth to water table, which could be uh, masking a, a um, depth to bedrock or an interface. And so we might use electrical properties and the acoustic properties to try and define where we've got the, the layering from the, the rock. And then we've got a different layer that's there from the, the water table, for example. So you'd actually need the electrical and seismic techniques to, to, to best define uh, both of those interfaces. So whilst it's incre increasing the cost to get the, the full information, it's, it's, it's often that it's not just one technique that's going to give that whole answer. Money well spent. Indeed. Okay. Um, so here we are. Another, I, I need to do geophysics surveys for archaeological appraisals, which comes up quite a lot. Can I just use the same data for my reconnaissance surveys? Yeah, so it, it depends on, on, on what the outcome is going to be. So often the data that's collected for an archaeological appraisal could be reprocessed or re-evaluated for uh, other features that might be in the ground, uh, such as uh, UXO, other buried obstructions um, that would have just been seen as being noise in the archaeological appraisal. Um, so sometimes that can be the case. Uh, often it will be different techniques that would be deployed. Uh, but it's always useful if, if you think you need to have a geophysical survey and you've had some archaeological work done, it's really useful to be able to share that, that other data set uh, with your geophysical experts so that we can evaluate and see what, what can be used rather than just repeating what's already been done again. Um, so which is the method, which is the method most suitable in sense of depth of investigation? So are different techniques good for different depths? Yeah, indeed. So it, it's always going to depend on on the geology, the ground conditions and the ground type. So uh, ground penetrating radar, for example, 
you would be able to get a, a certain depth of investigation and resolve features at that particular depth. Um, you might be able to see deeper with seismic techniques, um, electrical techniques you could see to a certain depth, but it depends on what the feature is. So there's no simple answer to just to say, yeah, just go and use electrical techniques to look for, for this depth. You really need to understand the interaction of the things that I talked about in terms of the, the targets, the, um, the ground conditions, the geology, and everything together, then the geophysicist can, can understand what's required and what would be the best techniques to apply. Yeah, talk to a geophysicist. Indeed. Yeah, okay, we had a survey completed that didn't work. Oh dear, the contractor didn't give much explanation. How do we know whether it was a method or the contractor that was wrong? Okay, so hopefully you would be able to ask for copies of the data. Um, so it's another thing within uh, BS5930 is that as part of the deliverable, really, you know, you've commissioned the survey, you kind of own that data that's been, been produced. So it could be sent to someone else to review to see was the data uh, a good quality? Uh, could other interpretations be be made from that? Um, if somebody can't provide you with the data they've collected an explanation of what they've done, I would say it's probably the contractor that's more at fault than the actual type of survey or anything else that was, was there because people should be quite open with this was the data, this is what we've done to it, this is what we can or cannot uh, see from it and these interpretations we've made. It, it shouldn't be a black box of, of just delivering a final outcome. Okay, a few more questions come in. Is GPR good for locating pile caps or piles accurately? Yes, we've had success in, in doing that. Um, so again, choosing the right frequency, um, understanding what the surface condition is going to be. Uh, so GPR generally works well when we've got a, a, a flat and um, I say smooth, but it's not going to be smooth, but a, a competent surface. So you get a good contact between the, the radar signal and the surface. Um, and we have had good experience in the past where we've been able to map out those pile caps. So um, that should be something that somebody can look out for you and, and, and give some ideas about. Okay. Um, okay, I've got a question that's coming from uh, uh, some of the works for one of the power companies. Um, we have had some recent projects where a lot of utility strikes have occurred to unknown services such as deep um, LV cables or PE gas services. We usually undertake GPR surveys on cable routes, but would you recommend any other survey methods? Um, so there can be some EM techniques to, to use as well. Um, we've also had success using ERT for looking for deeper cable routes and, and culverts. Um, so it'd be interesting to, to hear at kind of what depth those strikes have been occurring and, and what size uh, targets there are. Um, also GPL will be applicable to a certain depth, to a certain size pipe, as kind of alluding mm. to earlier. Um, but in terms of techniques, I mean, G GPR and EM, ERT, uh, gravity as well has, has had some success if, the, if that cable or duct is gonna be large enough. Um, but again, without being too wishy-washy, it does really depend on having the, the detail of, of what we're looking for. So we've got the question as detail, so we'll we'll get we'll be in touch. Don't worry. Yeah. Um, uh, from the different survey methods, can you show the price difference between them? So I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, gen generally the, the reconnaissance techniques and GPR tend to be the, the cheaper um, techniques to use, then we're going up in price really through the, the kind of seismics and the, the ERT. Uh, and as I say, microgravity tends to be one of the more expensive techniques to deploy other than maybe reflection because of the more time consuming element of the acquisition, but also the amount of processing that needs to go into, into the, uh, the gravity data as well. Great. Well, I think that's all the questions that we've had in. So thank you, Tim, and thanks for asking those questions. So I'd just like to um, remind everybody that um, our usual feedback survey will be out roughly about an hour after this webinar. If you could fill that in, that would be much appreciated. Certainly looking to keep these going. So if anyone's got any 
suggestions or things you'd like to hear about from us, then and please suggest them. Uh, next month's topic, Down to Earth um, webinar, is on geotechnics. We have our geotechnical director, Dr. Sean Williams, who's um, going to be giving us a title on geotechnics, what could possibly go wrong, um, and look at looking at a number of case studies relating to geotechnical failures. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all next month. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.